Today's program features our guest speaker, speaker Dr. Michael Gagnon. Close enough. Close enough. Dr. Gagnon was telling me that um, I was wrong when I tried to make it French. Gagnon. Uh, I probably am even wrong in my attempt at Frenchly pronouncing it. But Dr. Gagnon is a pleasant surprise to me because for this uh, very studious work that he has spent the past 20 years working on, he's refreshingly entertaining. And I think you're going to enjoy being here for today's program. Dr. Gagnon is a graduate of Hall County Public Schools, served in the U.S. Navy as an enlisted person on a nuclear-powered submarine. He has degrees from Gainesville Junior College, Georgetown University, and Emory University. He began teaching college history courses in 1992 and has served at William Patterson University, North Georgia College and State University, and Georgia Gwinnett College. In 2013, Dr. Gagnon was recipient of the VP ASA Scholarship Seed Grant at Georgia Gwinnett College, a competitive award for full-time faculty in support of scholarly development. Dr. Gagnon is a frequent presenter at scholarly conferences. He has had numerous articles published in the New Georgia Encyclopedia and the Athens Historian, as well as his reviews published in the American Historical Review, the Journal of Southern History and the Humanities and Social Sciences, HNET Online. His next major project is a biography of Augustin Clayton, for whom Clayton County is named. Dr. Gagnon's transition to an industrial south, the subject of his talk today, discusses the history of industrialization in the antebellum U.S., focusing on Athens as a case study. It was published by Louisiana State University Press in 2012 and is available for purchase in the library store. We hope that you'll join us for live refreshments following today's program, during which time Dr. Gagnon will be happy to sign copies of his book. Please join me now in giving a warm Athens, Georgia welcome to Dr. Michael Gagnon. What a great warm up act. Um, I've also taught at UGA, Georgia Tech, um, gosh, where else? North Georgia, Clemson, uh, a number of other places. It's what happens when you're a historian uh, in, in the modern world. You get your PhD and find out there are no jobs, so you, you take them wherever you can. Um, I started in, uh, learning about Athens about 30 years ago, about 25, 25 years ago. Um, originally, I, 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 I was working on Atlanta, and for my very first seminar in graduate school, uh, I was doing a paper on why Atlanta wound up being where it was, instead of being in Decatur, because Decatur's 20 years older, and there was this thing about, well, Decatur didn't want the railroad to come through. It turns out it's not quite what they were making it out to be, but the main thing was is that I said, well, where's this railroad coming from? Oh, it's because Athens, Georgia had three factories, and, and they had saturated their local market, and the same guys who started the factory started the railroad. Because now they need to get access to the outside world to not only move their raw cotton, but also to move their manufactured goods uh, and get access to credit and things of that sort. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is not really the topic of my book. They asked me to, to come up with a topic, and, and so I pulled some pieces from my book, and I really have to say I'm very glad they asked me to do that. Because I've gone back to look at some of the original research that I did, dig back in and, and rediscover, oh yeah, I remember I photocopied, you know, a hundred pages of this and a couple hundred pages of that. And then, you know, pulling it all out, it's like, oh, where, where did I see that logo? Where did I see that image? Because I had to pull images. And in doing so, I had to go through interlibrary library loan and find some more books and things. And so now, you know, just the, the, the idea that I'm starting to look at some of this stuff again, it's like, oh, I, I can actually do more stuff with what I've got because I actually archived a lot of stuff in my basement. Okay, now, um, what we're gonna talk about today is incorporation. How do you incorporate a business in the antebellum period? So, let's start with, with that idea. Incorporating a business in antebellum Athens. There we go. Why, why would you incorporate a business? Can you tell I, I teach class, I like these <laughs> rhetorical sorts of things, dealing with crowds. You're such a big crowd. <laughs> to avoid the blame. 
Okay, to avoid the blame. What, what's, what, anyone here ever incorporated a business? Anyone here ever thought about starting a business? Okay. Your choices are you can either be a partnership or a sole proprietorship, and they, they follow the same rules. Or you can incorporate, and, and today you can incorporate under an S-style corporation where it's just it's a small business incorporation. You just have to find three people who are willing to be officers in the corporation. Okay? Uh, so your mom and dad and you. It's usually how it works. You know, you want you want to start, say, a locksmith's shop. You know, you're gonna you're gonna go out and get a van filled full of locksmith stuff. Uh, you got fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment. Your choices are you can simply buy the stuff, fill it up, and go, or you can incorporate. Right? Now, you've still got $50,000 worth of stuff in your van doing business. The main reason you want to incorporate today is limited liability. Okay? Limited liability. What happens if you, if you start your business in 2005, and then we all know what happened in 2008, and nobody's hiring locksmiths? Well, okay, some of the banks already get that in those houses that they foreclosed on. Um, but other than that, they probably, they probably have a full-time locksmith on, on staff for that sort of thing. Um, nobody's coming to you and you're losing your business. Down the drain. Okay? Let's say during that time you've run up a tab with people who owe you money. You've got $100,000 worth of income waiting to come in and people aren't paying you. And you've got $100,000 worth of payments to make to other people. So you got cash flow. You could pay it and people would pay you. The problem is they're not paying you and as a result your creditors will demand payment. They'll take you to court. If you're a sole proprietor or a partnership, they won't just come and take your stuff. They'll also come and take your house and your clothes and your TV and anything else that they can take because you're responsible for the entire debt. If you're incorporated, and you're cor incorporated for $50,000 because that's what you told the Secretary of State's office when you filled out the paperwork and paid the fee and got the three people to be the officers, you're only in it for $50,000. And the second the $50,000 is gone, you can walk away from it. It's just a bad business, sorry. So the principal reason for incorporating today is limited liability because it allows you to get out of your just debts. It allows you special privileges that regular people don't get. That if you do it as a regular person through the regular process, you're up for the whole $100,000. And they will keep coming at you until you cough it up. They will make your life miserable. But if you're a corporation, you just laugh at them and start another business. Okay, now, that's the same thing that's going to happen in the antebellum period. You'll get limited liability. Shareholders will buy stock in your corporation, and you know if the, if the business goes under, they're only out the cost of their shares. You bought $100 worth of shares of stock, you're out $100. That's it. You're not out anything else. The other reason, second reason you'd want to incorporate is that you're able to raise larger amounts of money than you normally would because people are willing to take risks. If I know I'm only going to be out $100, I can invest in your business. That's a questionable business. But if I'm on the hook for the whole amount, they're going to come for the guy with the deepest pockets. And if I happen to have some money, they're going to come for me. That's how it works in partnerships. You go after all of them until you get your money back. But here, I'm only out whatever I invested. I'm only out for the stock. And so you're likelier to be able to convince more people to take a risk to invest in your business. The third is, this is in, more so in the antebellum period, is you get monopoly and tax rights. Okay, you don't get that today. But back then, the original idea of a corporation goes all the way back to the English you know, monarchy. The king gives a special grant, a monopoly, to the English Tea Company, or the African Slave Company, or, or whatever company, the Virginia Company. You get to populate North America. And you solely have the right to do that. And here are the bounds by in which it all works. And here's the charter that's all laid out and how it's all going to work. So traditionally, 
Corporations start with the idea that it's a monopoly and that they get special privileges, and frequently those privileges include not having to pay tax, or at least a lower tax, than everybody else. The flip side is, is that corporations have always been regulated. Have any of y'all ever heard the phrase laissez-faire? It's such a bogus idea. It never existed except in people's minds in the late 19th century as an ideal of what they wanted to go to, not about how government actually worked in, 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 in relationship to the economy. The economy always was regulated at some level. If you got a corporation to run a ferry or a, or a bridge, the legislature will tell you exactly how much you can charge for a horse, for a horse and a person, for a person walking on foot, for a wagon, for a stagecoach. Each and every one of those is laid out by law. So don't let anyone ever tell you that our country was founded on a laissez-faire. It just wasn't true. Okay, um, here are some shares of stock from the Georgia Railroad and Banking Company. This is actually uh, issued 19, in 1854. I found it on here someplace so closely. And you can see it's written on a lot because it's, been, it's exchanged hands. When you assign your stock to someone else, you sign it, literally, and put their name on it. And, and then it goes to the next person. They sign it, they sign it, they sign it. Legal documents are like that. This is for actually three shares of stock. It has a list somewhere there, right there, three. Um, there's a uh, locomotive coming across, um, and it tells you that it's in Augusta, is where they, they did this from, okay? By 1854, Augusta is the home of the Georgia Railroad Bank. I'm going to use them as an example for almost all of what I'm talking about today uh, because they start here in Athens, and it's a good explanation of how a corporation operates on a very large scale. Railroads are what we call large technological systems. I mean, you've got to figure out how to build the railroads, you've got to build bridges, you've got to buy land, you have to have locomotives, you have to have what's called rolling stock, I mean, the cars and everything. You have to make certain they don't run into each other. What happens if they hit a cow? Who's at fault if the cow gets on the railroad and you hit it? Do you have to replace the cow, or is the, cow got to the owner of the cow got to replace the train? Well, it's a big question in the 1840s. It hasn't been decided, because railroads are new. Um, the Georgia Railroad, this is their logo. Notice it says Augusta. In the book that I've, I've got this from, it says this is our only logo ever. Well, remember, this was not founded in Augusta. This was founded in Athens, Georgia. The principal office was in Athens, Georgia until 1842. Um, it's founded in 1833. Let me go ahead and, and walk us through the process. Um, the South Carolinians, who frequently were kind of ahead of the game of everyone else, um, they had money in Charleston. And they were thinking, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could get all the cotton from Georgia to come to Charleston instead of go to Savannah? Because right now, the way that it goes to the coast, if you've got cotton in the fields and the plantations, um, they somehow get it to Augusta, and Augusta puts it on a boat, flat bottom barge, and ships it down the river to Savannah. Okay? And then it goes out from there. Charleston has lost its economic clout um, for controlling kind of the southern economy by the early 18 aughts or so, um, and they want to get that back. Charleston had been the fourth largest city in North America in 1800, but by 1830, it wasn't even the top 10. They want to get that back. So in the late 1820s, they start a railroad called the Charleston and Hamburg Railroad. Hamburg is right across the Savannah River from Augusta. Okay? That's where East Augusta is today, more or less. So they complete the line to Hamburg. It's 137 miles long in 1833. It is the longest railroad in the world under single management at the time that it opens in 1833. And it's all entirely in South Carolina. And Georgians are thinking, you know, why should they have the only railroad? Why shouldn't we be able to get our stuff from Athens to Augusta a little easier? And oh, by the way, we have factories in Athens now. By 1835, there are three factories capitalized at about $200,000 in Athens. There's the 
Athens, the first is the Georgia factory at Whitehall. It wasn't called Whitehall at the time, but the White family had moved there before they called it Whitehall. Um, so you have um, the Georgia factory is the very first factory. We call it the Georgia factory because it's the first factory in Georgia. Hence the Georgia factory. Athens factory is the second. Princeton factory is the third. Um, these people in Athens have already developed an industrial market here. They've saturated their market with rough, coarse goods, mainly producing coarse thread and cloth, which is mainly being used for slave clothing. It's not finer goods. And they're trying to think of, well, how can we, you know, now that we've saturated our market, where else can we ship it to? Well, it's too hard to get to Augusta. Because if you ship a load of cotton to Augusta from Athens, it takes about a week. Now, there is a road. It's called the Federal Road. The federal government maintains it, but it's such a bad road. Well, let's put it this way. If you've got six horses pulling and wagging, a uh, thousand pounds of cotton. How many horsepower is that? Six. Yeah. You know, about the, about the size of a small riding lawnmower. One that you probably don't want to keep more than a couple years because it's going to wear out quick. So you've got the equivalent of a small riding lawnmower going over a hundred miles, pulling a thousand pounds in a deeply rutted road. It kills the horses every time. It just does. And so you always have to replace your horses every time you, you haul your stuff to market. And local people in Athens complain vigorously. Were but, oxen and mules used at that time in the early period? Or? They might have been, but I, I haven't actually seen anyone discuss that. So it, it's entirely possible. Um, there's no reason why you couldn't, but I haven't seen anything that actually said that, so I can't say for sure that that happened. Um, but the main thing is, is, there is a road. It is actually a road that's maintained by the federal government. But even in a road that's maintained, it's so badly maintained, it kills the horses. It's hardly worth the while to transport your goods because you have to, the, the cost of transaction is so difficult. So let's build a railroad. So once South Carolina creates it, they say, well, let's build us a railroad. The problem is someone in Eatonton had already thought of this two years before in 1831 and had gotten a charter from the legislature to build a turnpike or railroad to Eatonton. So they've got to figure out how to get around that. Um, so they're going to meet with a bunch of towns, including Eatonton, and say, well, why don't we go together on this? Let's build a railroad that comes to a common point and then branches off from there, maybe to Eatonton and Madison and Athens. And we'll call this place Union Point. What do you think? Put it in Green County. That's how the name Union Point comes in. Um, so by October 1833, they've they, they decided that this is what they're going to do. So the Hamburg Railroad is completed in June. By October, they cut a deal with the surrounding towns. In December, they get a law passed by the legislature. Now, this is really different from incorporating today. Today, all you have to do is go to the Secretary of State's office, fill out the forms, pay your fee. That's it. Have, have those three uh, officers on, on the form. That's it. Back then, you had to have a law passed because you're getting special privileges that are not available to other people. And so every time someone incorporated, you had to pass a law. And it's contentious because Augusta doesn't want a railroad because it's already the end point of where everyone goes. If you want to go have some economic trade, you go to Augusta. If you build a railroad, then they don't necessarily have to come to Augusta, do they? They go someplace else and drop off their cotton. Now, it may wind up in Augusta, but they didn't have to come there to do it. So Augusta feels they're going to lose out. So they aren't real keen on this idea. The legislature in the law said, okay, since we don't know that everybody's really keen on this, and you declare that this is going to help the whole upcountry of Georgia, here's what we're going to do. You have to sell 5,000 shares within a 10-day period. We're going to open it up. You, have, you say this is a good idea, then surely you can sell this. You can subscribe 5,000 shares. Now, each share is $100. You have to put down a minimum, minimum of $5 deposit on your share when you subscribe to it. Um, but it's only open for 10 days, and we're going to say that we're going to put 200 shares in this town, 300 shares in that town, 500 shares in another town. 
And that way they're all over the upcountry and no one can monopolize it for their own purposes so that we will democratize this idea of incorporation. So what happens is, is during that 10-day period, they're going to sell 6,015 shares. I actually went through the subscription books and counted them up and looked who bought, at who bought them. And it turned out that 4,000 of the 6,000 shares that were purchased were purchased by a guy named William Williams. Okay? But as a result, in March, they're actually able to meet in Athens at James K. Mack's, James K. Mack's house on Meek Street and, and organize the Georgia Railroad formally and elect its officers. Guess who they elected treasurer? William Williams, because he owned all the shares of stock. But it, remember, he only had to put down $5 per share, which means he put down $20,000 in a 10-day period. But it also meant he had to ride through the countryside, from town to town to town, to buy those shares of stock at each of those towns in order to guarantee it. He couldn't just stay here in Athens, which is where he was living. Okay, so it, it was a, a big effort, plus he had to have $20,000 cash on hand to do this. Turned out he had just returned from Florida where he had been operated a bank in Tallahassee, had got along with the territorial legislature, and they more or less asked him to leave. He had a lot of enemies there. And, and so he brought his $60,000 cash with him when he returned to Georgia from Tallahassee, supposedly in a big wagon. And it was all in gold, supposedly. I, I haven't seen much on that except for secondary sources. Was it a closed subscription to pretty much friends and just a closed group, or was it open to the general public? It was open to the general public. Okay, so anyone can come in and buy a share of stock. Um, these are the main people behind it. Augustin Clayton, for whom Clayton Street is named, and who is the uh, uh, subject of my next uh, scholarly work. Um, he's a judge of the Western Circuit. He's the guy who started the factories. He's, uh, he's the guy who gets Indian removal underway with, with the Cherokee cases in the 1830s. Um, he's going to wind up in the bank war, uh, which is the subject of what I'm working on now. William Deary, I got this out of the Georgia Railroad Company's kind of historical works, and I don't really think this is the picture of William Deary. I think this is the picture of his son, William, Dr. William E. Deary, who lived in Augusta. Because they describe him as, as William E. Deary, and they say he's a founder, but I think that's actually William Deary's son. I suspect we don't have a real image of, of the original William Deary. This is James K. Mack. Uh, K. Mack had been a political operative in in Milledgeville, which is the state capital. He'd been the state printer. He was a very political man. Um, he had been a real uh, entrepreneur as well, had been tied up with the state bank. The state of Georgia owned its own bank for a while, the Central Bank of Georgia. Um, and then this is the guy they, they hired, J. Edgar Thompson, to build their railroad. He is their chief engineer. Um, he is our first engineer in Georgia. He's going to be the guy who puts together the plan and builds it and makes it happen. He's supposedly the guy who gave Atlanta its name, you know, changed it from Arthursville to Atlanta. Um, he, he's supposed to have said Atlantic because it, it connected, the Georgia Railroad connects to the State Railroad, which was the Atlantic and Western Railroad of the state of Georgia, which is, was its official name. And he said Atlantic masculine, Atlanta feminine, a coin word if you like to go ahead and adopt. Yeah, it sounds a little wordy to me. I don't think he actually said that. I think what he actually said was, we named it after uh, Governor Lumpkin's daughter, Martha. It was originally Marthasville, right? And Governor ex-Governor Lumpkin was the director of the state railroad. So uh, he's a superintendent of the railroad. So if we're going to change it from Marthasville because it's too long to get on a schedule, let's go to her nickname, Atalanta. has an extra A, Atta. Which was a Greek nymph who ran very fast. Um, and she was apparently fleet of foot. Um, we do know that J. Edgar Thompson winds up up in Pennsylvania. He's hired as the chief engineer for the Pennsylvania Railroad, builds the Pennsylvania Railroad, creates the town of Altoona, which he said looked a whole lot like the area in Georgia known as Alatoona. He has this habit of dropping extra A's out of names. <laughs> Okay, that's why I think he probably just dropped the A out of Atlanta and called, called it Atlanta instead of, or as we say in Atlanta, Atlanta. 
EDA, L-A-N-N-A is the correct way to pronounce it, LAMP. Okay, um, so these are some of the principal people. I don't have a photo or an image for William Williams, but he's really key here. Without his money, there would be no Georgia Railroad. Now, each share cost 100 bucks. They had to put down five, $5. Sometimes, if they're going to the upcountry, like over here to Jefferson, they'll say, well, you know, we know some of you folks up the upcountry don't actually have cash. We'll take a note. And as you make the money, you can pay the note on it. So we'll take a note on it. Um, and later on, we're going to call into the subscription 15 to 20 percent at a time. Usually per year, you'll pay an additional 15 or 20 dollars, depending on what the board of directors calls for. And by the end of about four or five years, you'll have called up the whole hundred dollars. The problem is, is in 1837 we have a major depression in this country. Panic of 1837. The last six years is as is the 19th century equivalent to the Great Depression of the 20th century. It was a very long and severe depression. We'll talk more about that later. Um, in 1836, before the depression hits, they added banking to the charter. They went back to the state legislature and they said, hey, we'd like to start a bank. We've got all this money sitting around that we haven't used to pay for this stuff. Let's make some interest on it by loaning the money out of interest. And that's when Augusta decides they get interested. They want to buy into that because they know about banking. Um, Augusta Town Council buys 2,000 of the $7,500 shares right off the bat. Because they see this as a way of stealing control of the corporation away from Athens. Um, they're going to open up independent branches in Athens and Augusta. Actually, the branch here in Athens is known as the principal bank. Because this is where it starts. And the, the branch in, in Augusta is simply the branch of this bank. Um, but with that national depression in 1837, the guys leading the bank here in Athens don't have as deep of pockets as the guys in Augusta. And so they're caught up short with their payments. And in the end, they have to liquidate the bank. Augusta purchases the controlling share of the bank. And in 1841, they vote to close the Athens Bank and move all the operations of the Georgia Railroad from Athens to Augusta. Hostile takeover. 19th century style. Okay, so in 1842, we, we closed uh, Athens. Now, I, I wanted to give you a sense of some of the issues of moving the bank. How many of you saw my presentation at the Art Museum a uh, year ago, February? Good, so this will be new to you. Um, here's roughly the Charleston Hamburg Railroad. It does not connect across the Savannah River. The Augusta Town Council will not allow a bridge to be built to connect it. So you have to take everything off the train in Augusta, carry it across a, a walking bridge, and put it on a different train in Hamburg. And this is fairly typical in the 19th century. Plus they have different gauges. A gauge is how wide apart are the wheels. Uh, standard gauge in the north is 4 foot 10, but it wasn't standard anywhere yet. Standard gauge in the south was somewhere around five feet, but again, it wasn't standard. So whatever, if you're building a railroad and they're all brand new, everybody's building them at different widths. That means you can't take this locomotive and put it on that track because it'll fall off. The wheels don't fit. New technology, you have to standardize stuff. So from Augusta to Union Point is here. And then um, you could go up to Athens or Madison. They never did build the one down to Eatonton. The Athens folks kind of lied when they told Eatonton that, well, they, I wouldn't say lie, they just didn't follow through on their promises, let's put it that way. You know, times weren't right, we never had the money, there didn't seem to be interest, and so we never, we, we got you to agree to this and use your money to, for our own purposes. So when you get mad at Augusta for stealing the bank, just remember Athens stole the railroad from Eatonton. So there's it. Um, so this is, this is what they're allowed under their original charter to do is to build a branch to Athens and a branch to Eaton and theoretically another branch down here to Eatonton. In 1836, there is a national effort to build a railroad, a national railroad in the south to connect the southern ports to the Ohio River, probably at Lexington or, or uh, some, Cincinnati, someplace up in there. Um, and Georgia wants to be a part of it, but they sent their people too late. They hadn't enacted laws to incorporate this railroad in the state of Georgia because our legislature meets at a different time. 
So when we sent it, the, the convention was held at Knoxville, Tennessee, on July 4th, 1836, and, and we sent J. Edgar Thompson and William Deary and a number of other people are going to go up to, to Knoxville, and they're going to propose going up through Raven Gap. Why don't we just extend the Athens branch up to Raven Gap, Gap and then over to the, to the Tennessee Valley through the mountains? Now, you know, the Smoky Mountains are kind of tall. But, but they found some gaps. There's the little Tennessee that you could go through some of this, and, and eventually someone does build a railroad there. Um, alternatively, they said what we could do instead from Athens is go west toward uh, Hall County and eventually get about where I-75 is now and head north until we hit what is now Chattanooga, none of which existed at the time. Okay, so these were two proposals. It turns out that the rest of Georgia said, oh, you're going to siphon off all the prosperity and the wealth through Athens and directly to Charleston. This is awful. We'll just, we'll be the hewers of wood and carriers of water for those brilliant people in Charleston this can't do. So, these were all both very expensive. So instead, what they do, rather than extending the Athens branch, is they agree to extend the Madison branch to the Chattahoochee River, and then the state of Georgia would build a railroad from the Chattahoochee which, oh, by the way, is the boundary of the Cherokee Nation in 1836, to the Tennessee River, which is six miles across the state line in Tennessee. Okay, so they have to send General Newman, Noonan, Daniel Noonan, gets sent to negotiate with Tennessee about all of that. It takes the state of Georgia about 17 years to build that railroad because there's this major depression. A lot of people get involved. Politics, who knew politics would get involved in a big state works like this, huh? Billions of dollars involved. But what happens is it's put here because there's going to another railroad coming up from the Macon area, Forsyth, Georgia. There's a railroad from Savannah to Macon, another railroad from Macon to Forsyth, and then they were going to build, extend the railroad from Forsyth up to Chattahoochee. Originally, the legislation said it would end at the Chattahoochee, um, but it didn't. Before they built all of that, they decided to move six miles southeast into what is now underground Atlanta which is not necessarily the best place in the world to put it. Um, apparently, it involved about 60 years of, of uh, 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 court work. There are a lot of lawsuits over this, the fact that they moved it. Uh, it never goes to Decatur, which was the obvious place to put it. It could have just as easily gone to Decatur as any place else, because Decatur, at least, was a place, unlike Atlanta, which was nothing. But probably there was money involved, real estate transactions involved. You know, that usually happens with political work like this. Um, the state of Georgia still owns the Western Atlantic, the WNA. They just do. Today we, we rent it out to CSX. Um, I don't know what the lease is on it. I'm sure it's millions of dollars a year. And, and that keeps our taxes relatively low in Georgia. They've been that way since 1851 when we opened the WNA Railroad. Okay, so yes, socialism, state-owned enterprise, keeps our taxes low. Okay, um, this is an image that was over the vault, in, except it was in color, over the vault in um, um, the Georgia Railroad Bank in Augusta through about 1958 or so. Um, and I got it out of one of their books. It was you know, already turned into a lithograph, and you see it signed down here. I, I don't know who did it, but it was signed. But it was a major mural over their vault. And supposedly, this is when they brought the train, the locomotive, to Atlanta from Madison because they hadn't completed the branch from Madison to Atlanta yet. And they needed a railroad to start running it from Atlanta northward, the southern terminus. That's, that's what Atlanta was, just the southern terminus of the, the state road. Uh, and they needed to move up. Um, the, big, the big problem with the WNA is you had to go through this mountain they had to drill a tunnel. There's a place in North Georgia called Tunnel Hill. It's named after the tunnel through the hill. Okay. Um, this whole area here in Georgia is Georgia's antebellum industrial zone. Everything from Augusta to Columbus has factories. This is one of the big finds of, of, of my research, is that there are dozens of factories. No, it's not the North. This is not New England. This is not England. But it's significantly more industrialized than a lot of other places in the world. Okay. Um, 
So you have factories in places like Augusta, Athens, um, Madison, Newton County has three or four, um, Henry County has some, uh, Milchville has a factory, uh, Macon has a factory, uh, Columbus has a power canal along the Chattah falls of the Chattahoochee, has two or three factories down there. This is a tremendous industrial zone. By 1860, Georgia is the most industrialized place in the South, and Athens is the most industrialized place in Georgia. And we'll reign that from 1840 to about 1870. In 1870, other people leap ahead. Okay, but I wanted to give you an idea. These are the railroads. By the 1860s, if you look at the pattern of railroads, Georgia has a real railroad connection. It has a network. You can go places. You know, that's what you want with a, a rail network, a transport network, is you want to get to a place that you want to go to. What's the point of having a a road that starts no place and goes to no place, you know, like the WNA. It started in the woods at a place that eventually became Atlanta, and it ended at, at the edge of the river at a place that eventually became Chattanooga. Both places came into existence because of the railroad, not the other way around. Okay. So you can see that this is part of a larger network. It's still something working itself out. There's still going to be lots of stock sold every time you build a new connection on the railroad, you'll probably amend your charter, you'll get tax breaks. The Georgia Railroad paid zero taxes for years and years. Then they took up uh, banking, and they wanted to tax them at a different rate as a bank, and they had to go back and forth about how they were going to be taxed. The state of Georgia, it wasn't until like 1904 that they finally decided how they were going to tax the Georgia Railroad. Lots and lots of litigation, lots and lots of lawyers. Um, were the three factories, the textile factories, they were before the railroad, so did they have influence financially then to get Athens on the map? The, the directors railroad? of the factories were also directors of the railroad. Okay. Okay, so there is a direct connection between both of them. Um, you know, when you have an overlapping directorate like that, you're essentially got one group of people making all the decisions. And they're the people with deep pockets, they're the people who are making decisions for this area. They're the movers and shakers. Yes, it's frequently behind closed doors. Um, but, you know, that's the way it worked. And the idea was is we will sell stock and that will democratize it. You'll have the right to come in and help make these decisions. Um, but, of course, whoever owns the most stock has the most say. Um, William Williams becomes a factory owner. He buys uh, what eventually becomes the Princeton factory. So if you go down, what is it, Village Avenue, and you go by the subdivision of Princeton, Princeton Mill, and that a subdivision off Millage? I think it's Lumpkin, off Lumpkin. What? It's off Old 441. Okay, off Old 441. Um, that Princeton Mill was there until 1973 when it burned down. So the old factory was there, it wasn't operated, it hadn't been operated since the 1930s. But it was there. How about the foundry system? Did that come after the railroad was established? The foundry comes later. Okay, I'm going to talk about that momentarily. Um, here's a bill issued by the bank in Athens. And um, so this was issued before 1842. One of the things I noticed this morning when I was looking through here is it was never signed. It has places for the signatures of the cashier of the bank and the bank president. I, don't, I think someone is going to cover this in another lecture during my smart week, so I don't want to steal all their fire. But the basic idea was there was no paper money before 1913. The federal government did not make paper money, except briefly during, during the American Civil War something they call greenbacks, and nobody liked greenbacks. They liked cold, hard cash, coin, what they called specie. And the problem was there wasn't enough specie in the country, and it was too difficult to ship around. But that's what everybody preferred. So banks printed notes that acted as money. I bet all of you have done this too. How many of you ever used a checking account? Works just like money, doesn't it? Right? Well, that's what these were. They work just like money. The they print it out so it can't be counterfeited easily. It has a denomination. By law, they're not allowed to make bills less than $5. Almost every, uh, every state legislature passes that in their banking laws. You can't make these notes less than $5. Um, it has to be signed by the cashier and by the president of the bank. So there's no national people, there's no national currency except for coins. And um, you have to go back to the bank See, it says go to the print. We will pay you cash at the principal bank. 
So when we issue a loan, we simply print bills and give you the money. And it has your name on it at some point. And you want to spend it, you have to sign it just like a check and give it to the next person. When they want to get rid of it, they have to sign it, give it to the next person. And that way, if someone doesn't make good on it, they have a record of who owned it and they'll go back and see, well, if you endorsed a check, you have to make good on this, even though you used it by you know, paying for something else. You assumed it was good. If no one makes good on it, they're gonna sue everyone on the check until they find the person with the deepest pockets who can pay for it. This is why Andrew Jackson hated banks. He was the endorser of a check that was made good on, and he had to make good on it. So it's one of the reasons Andrew Jackson hated banks. Um, all, every bank in the country pretty much had bank notes. And I won't go into the details of that, though it's, actually it's really kind of fun. Um, corporations in the age of Jackson are fear, dramatically fear. Mostly because they are banks, and banks have a lot of power. And the biggest bank, the most famous corporation of them all, the only corporation that was a national corporation was the Bank of the United States, located on Chestnut Street in Philadelphia. Okay, this is the second bank of the United States. It's across the street from the first bank of the United States, which went out of business in 1911, just in time for us not to have any sort of national financial system uh, for the War of 1812, okay? Uh, which is why they reincorporated a second bank. Philadelphia is the most important financial city in the country in 1816 when they created the second bank. Uh, BUS, B-U-S, Bank of the United States is what they called it. It acted a lot like today's Federal Reserve Board. It regulated the currency. It made certain other banks pay their notes, okay? And, P and of course, the banks hated that. And there's always this fear that the few people who control the Bank of the United States would get too powerful and it'd be too influential. And they'd dabble in politics, which they did. And then we had depressions like the Panic of 1819, caused in part because the Bank of the United States had an embezzlement at its Baltimore branch and caused people to lose confidence in the currency. And we had a two-year depression as a result. Okay. It's not elected. These are powerful people, but they're not elected by anyone. The government of the United States only owned 20% owned of the stock in the Bank of the United States. The rest was all owned by private individuals. And people said that's too much power for private individuals to have over the economy if they're regulating the, the, the economy that way. So people didn't like it. Andrew Jackson's going to wage his war in part because he got stuck foot in the bill when a bank note that he endorsed wasn't made good on. The bank went bankrupt, and he had to pay for it. He wages war against the Bank of the United States. Oh, by the way, Augustine Clayton, Clayton Street's name, Clayton County's name, is one of the guys who helps Andrew Jackson wage war against the Bank of the United States. Stay tuned for my next book. Um, even today, banks are only as good as our confidence in them is. I mean, Money's just paper. It has no intrinsic value, unlike cold hard cash that you can melt down to the metal in the hopes that there's enough valuable metal in it. So if people lose confidence in the banking system, the whole system collapses. You know, kind of like after 2008. We lost confidence in the system. People said, I'm not going to spend my money. I'm going to keep it at home. And as a result, businesses close, the economy slows, there's not that multiplier effect that a dollar going through the economy will generate so many jobs. The people of the 1830s were scared to death of corporations, and the corporation they hated the most was the Bank of the United States. The many-headed hydra is the way that the Democratic Party referred to it. And every time Andrew Jackson cut off a uh, one end of it, it would grow two more heads. Okay. Nicholas Biddle is going to be the uh, president of the bank. There are a whole lot of other people. Eventually, in 1836, Jackson forces the Bank of the United States to go out of business. It actually gets rechartered under, the, uh, under state law in, in, in Pennsylvania, but it's no longer a national bank. It is only a state bank, and it doesn't have the same power. So when the crisis comes in 1837, we have a panic 
Okay. The Panic of 1837, I just read a really great book on. It's called The Many Panics of 1837. Uh, the book just came out last year from Cambridge University Press. Uh, I don't know the author. Her, her last name is Le Le Lepfler, I think. But she's, it's a really great book, very readable. It sounds just like what happened in 2008. It's about credit swaps. Does that sound vaguely familiar? Credit swaps? It's exactly what happens in, in, in 1837. A tale of three cities going from the best of times to the worst of times, flush times of the 1830s to the depths of the Depression in six months. The economy collapses. England, London, the Bank of England is worried about the outflow of currency, so they crunch their credit. They draw up their credit. The exchange of credits, the swapping of letters of credit across the Atlantic, they say, we, we, we're not going to issue any more credit. You have to pay up. People didn't have the money to pay up. The reason they wanted it is they were bleeding currency, and they, they were afraid they were going to run out of cold, hard cash. And their job, their monopoly in London was to maintain the currency. So to keep themselves solvent and maintain the English currency, they pull back on credit. There's a two to three month lag between England and the United States because of bad weather, and you have to cross the Atlantic to get the information across. And in the meanwhile, there's real problems in cotton going from New Orleans to New York, and several firms collapse with, with the crunching of credit in London that exacerbates the whole thing, and the entire economy goes into free fall by May 1837. And as a result, We now have the basis of every economic crisis of the antebellum period. Two main causes, you have an unstable banking system, usually because of excessive credit, and the collapse of a, uh, the price of an agricultural, major agricultural commodity. In this instance, it's cotton, 1837. We're gonna find out that in 1819, is that embezzlement in Baltimore and cotton. England had too much cotton, they stopped buying it, the price of cotton collapses, Everybody had credit in the United States based on the price of cotton that they were going to sell next year. So you're always running in arrears. I'm going to pay for next year. I'm going to buy the things this year and pay for it next year. Buy it on credit. 1837, this is going to last up to eight years in the American South. It's only going to last five or six years in the North. This is as major a depression as the Great Depression of the 1930s. The difference is most people still grew their own food, so they didn't start with that mostly, except in the cities. It's going to have a wave of bank failures and uh, runs on banks, and it's going to be the collapse of cotton prices again. In 1857, um, it has to do with this place called, get this, Crimea. It's been in the news lately. Crimea had been in a war in 1855, 1856. England, Russia, and the Turks were all fighting over control of the Black Sea. And for two years, the Ukraine was shut down the breadbasket of Europe. It comes back online. Guess who was providing wheat to Europe in the years that the Ukraine was offline? The United States, Canada, and Argentina. Yes, it's a global market in grains. And as a result, Ukraine comes back online. We have a bumper crop in all four places, and the price of wheat collapses. Plus, you have an insurance bank in Ohio that goes under destabilizing the system. Plus, it turns out we have too much manufacturing inventory in the north, so this is a new thing that's added to the mix. What do factories do when they have too much inventory? They make too much stuff. They shut down. They lay off their workers. Workers don't have any money to pay for anything. They don't pay their rent. They don't buy food. Okay. Same thing that happens today. You don't have a factory. You, you got too much stuff. GM, Ford, whoever, you shut down. We'll shut down that line for you. Okay. If we look at 1837, this is after, this is the resolution of the panic. This is when the banks shut down. People demand their money from the banks. It starts here, around New Orleans area, and then spreads from there to New York. May 10th is when it really gets bad in New York. They are separate events, but these are the two centers. And it's when New York shuts down the banks and say, we're going to shut our doors and we're gonna, not going to... We're not going to pay specie for our notes for six months or three months, something like that, in order to stabilize the system. And everyone said, Phew, thank God. And all the other banks are going to shut down, too, because they don't want the drain of their reserves from their vaults. Nobody has enough coins in their vaults 
to pay off all their depositors. All of you have seen this done in the movies. Um, but before I get there, later depressions. The economy collapses under, under un unregulated capitalism. The economy collapses every 20 years. It's so frequent, it's, it's got a name. They call it the business cycle. Isn't that a nice euphemism? The business cycle. You know, boom and bust. It doesn't really describe the depths of agony that people who lost it all go through. 1873, 1893, 1907, 1919, 1929. 1929, they coined the word depression because panic sounded too much like the Home Alone kid. Depression just sounded like pe what people do when they have no money. You know, they get depressed. But because the Great Depression lasted 13 years, by the 1940s, it's regulated, and they are going to come more often, but not as deep. 1946, 1959, 1974, 1981, 1992, 2000, 2008, but 2008 is so significantly bad. Why? Because we stopped regulating the banks again. All through the 1990s, I kept telling my students, it's going to come. We've deregulated the banks. We've let everything go that we put in place to stop banks from doing stupid things. You know, Bizarre credit swaps. And so, it, you know, if you don't keep the lessons of history, you get bit on the butt by it. It's that simple. Okay, so the thing I tell my students be prepared. It's going to happen again. I mean, just look at history. It happens regularly, it's going to happen again. Bankers will do stupid things, and the economy will collapse. It's that simple. That's what has happened throughout American history. And even though you play by the rules as you understand it, that doesn't mean you can't lose it all through no fault of your own. That's the history of economics in America. Okay, so banks failed to pay, pay depositors. These are known as bank runs. You ever seen a movie where they had a bank run? Who can name a real famous one? It's a wonderful life. It's a wonderful life with Jimmy Stewart. It's a savings loan that those no longer exist. Trillion dollar bank failure in the 1980s under Ronald Reagan. Um, actually, I, I've heard you say it was only $500 billion. It wasn't actually a trillion. Um, but the government bailed out the banks in, in the 1980s because all the savings and loans went bankrupt because they made bad real estate deals, which is pretty much the basis of all the other ones, too. Credit swaps and bad real estate. Um, think uh, Michael's Tuppence in the movie Mary Poppins. Remember, he's standing there going, I want my Tuppence, I want my Tuppence. Students say they don't watch Mary Poppins, I can't believe it. <laughs> They don't know who the bird lady is or why Michael wants his tongues. Um, I saw a saving Mr. Mr. Banks there, so that's, that's, that's okay. See how they all want their money back and they have to shut the doors and kick everybody out? This is normal in America. This ha happens to be in London, but uh, it's normal. This is what a bank run is. People want their money. We don't have enough money in the vaults. We shut the doors. We send them home. Tell them we'll pay you another day. Don't bother us today. Okay. Creditors start to sue everyone. I gotta pay my debt, so you have to pay me. That's the way it works. The only people who win are the lawyers. Because they get a fee regardless of who wins and gets the money. Right? And so um, almost everybody fails to be able to pay because there's just not enough cash in the cash flow for everyone to pay everyone they owe. And as a result, you get foreclosed. Usually it goes up for a sheriff's sale. In the antebellum period, you would have families for sale, in the, even though slaveholders would claim that enslaved people were parts of their family, they never sold the white kids. They only sold the black ones. And this is going to be primarily a southern thing, because this is where the cotton is in 1819, 1837. So a lot of these failures are going to happen. You're going to go to the courthouse and someone is going to sell your property from the courthouse steps. How many of you know people who, who got a really good deal on a foreclosed property? Know someone who did that? So they made, they profited off of somebody else's misery. It's the American way. If I can buy your house for pennies on the dollar, I've done good. You lost it all, but that's too bad. That's the history of our country in the 1830s, late 1830s. Nobody, you may have property, but you can't liquidate it. You can't turn it into cold, hard cash and pay off your debts. And therefore, someone else will sell it for whatever money they can, and usually it's for pennies on the dollar. 
five to ten percent what the val actual value is, is what you'll get. Okay. Other corporations, someone asked me about foundries. Yes, um, more places are going to form later in Athens. You can see the dates after them. Originally, it's going to be factories. Um, you're going to see the Athens factory doesn't actually incorporate until 1848. It's kind of late in the game. Um, turns out that even after they incorporate, it's mainly a family business. Um, it's just that they bought up the stock and, and they were able to share it across cousins. And, and that made it easier to keep the company alive because if you have a partnership or, or a sole proprietorship, when that person dies, the business is gone. You have to live with it. So here's an opportunity to take a business and keep it alive after the, the, the people, who, the originators die. Uh, so the mutual is actually started in Griffin, Georgia, uh, Cuthbert actually, Cuthbert, Georgia. And, um, and then Athens steals it from it by buying the stock and voting to move it here to Athens. Um, really nice people I visited with them this morning before I came. Uh, I did a lot of work with them. Um, Pioneer Paper, Athens Foundry, Bank of Athens in the 1850s. These are all the incorporations in Athens that I know of prior to the Civil War. Um, there weren't a lot because these were special deals. Every single time you had to pass a law, you had to have political clout. You had to be able to get people to take time to say, okay, this is worth doing. Um, so it, it needs to be a fairly well financed thing. Turns out Pioneer Paper is not that big a deal. Um, the foundry was originally started as Athens Steam Company. It was a steam works. They, they made metal products and things like that. You know, the fence at UGA is probably the most famous thing, but they started making steam engines by the late 1850s, um, and things of that sort. And, and then eventually they become much, much bigger. Um, the one I didn't have here, because I don't recall if it was incorporated or not, was the gas works. Henry Grady's family eventually buys that up. His dad, uh, William Grady, buys up the gas works in the late 1850s and, and operates it until his death. And the Grady family operates it through about 1866, and then they sell it off to Hal Cobb's estate. Um, okay, so all of these have something in common. Um, they're kind of expensive to start up. They're iffy. They're not the normal sorts of things you might find now. It's not about agriculture. It's not about slaves. It's not about education. So if you have something that's if you need to raise money and you need to have limited liability, paper factories tend to burn down. Got a lot of paper loose. Um, so you, you probably want to incorporate, cover your losses, and you're, you're going to need insurance. There's a connection here. All these factories are going to be insured. Um, you're going to have people who understand factories who want to insure them. You have directories that overlap. You're trying to limit your risks. That's what this is all about. What can we do to make a buck and limit our risk? Let's incorporate, let's get insured, let's follow the rules of the state so that we make money at every step of the game without damaging uh, our reputation, because that's important too. Well, on these different corporations, you're talking about iron, you're talking about paper, you're talking about textiles, was it as much the location as it was on the resources that were available, plus the proximity to the water that brought them about? A lot of it has to do with simply the quickening of the economy. I mean, it, if you don't have a very high level of an economy, you don't need a paper factory. Because paper factories are making writing paper, they're making ledger paper, they're making uh, newspaper. But this was a ground wood operation, it wasn't a rag factory. Was no, it's a rag factory. Okay, so ground, ground wood doesn't come, you know, pulp wood doesn't come until much later. So this was tied into textiles in pop. Oh, absolutely. Okay. You, you know, and in fact, there's this one really great story in my book that talks about um, an African-American whose last name is Holsey, who grew up here in Athens and learned to read even though he wasn't supposed to under slavery because he was a house slave. And the kids in the house liked to teach him. But he purchased books for himself by selling rags to the, to the paper mill. And then got the white kids to go buy the books for him, which they would then teach him to read and write out. And he later becomes a leader of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. He's a bishop. Found in Payne College and things of that sort. So it's a really, it's a really neat story. Um, but it creates opportunities that wouldn't be in a place otherwise. You know, you can make money stuff by picking up rags and selling. Um, so, but you have you have to have enough of an economy to support that amount of paper. Merchants only use so much paper for ledgers. Right, people writing 
only use so much paper for writing letters and things of that sort. So if you're using a lot of paper, it probably means you're shipping it out elsewhere. You've probably got newspapers who are buying it from you because you need to make enough money to make it worth your while. Now, th this is not a big, big establishment, not as a paper mill. Later gets bought up by a tire company. It's known as the cord mill uh, down on uh, one of the creeks, Barber Creek, I think it is. It's either the McNutt Creek or Barber Creek on Bacon Highway. Okay. Um, the foundry, of course, is downtown. Is it called Puritan Mill? Yes. Yeah. Cordage factory. Because it had cords in the tires. They were making cords, those cotton cords. Still, instead of steel belts, they had cotton cords. So again, it's, it's tied to the agriculture. So, and cotton grew as far north as Watkinsville. You didn't, in the Antebellum period, you really didn't get any further north than that because it just, it just didn't grow. It's not until after the Civil War they started using fertilizer that you're able to grow further north. Um, in 1848, they passed a general incorporation law in Georgia. It's mainly for factories, to make it easier for factories to incorporate. They just go down to the county courthouse, they can incorporate. Individuals can do this too, but they don't get limited liability. So what's the point? Why incorporate if you don't get limited liability? Um, and, and oh, by the way, everybody knows if you're incorporated or not. They have credit reporting agencies as early as the 1840s. Following the panic of 1837, People in the North wanted to know who the people were that they were selling things to. If I'm going to accept your credit, I want to know if you're credit worthy. R.G. Dunn & Company, when he eventually becomes Dunn & Bradstreet, donated their credit reports up through the 1880s during the 1930s. They figured everybody who got reported on was dead by then. So, so they could turn them in. So I've been up to Harvard, and I've looked at their credit report. I've looked at all the credit reports for Athens from the 1830s to, excuse me, 1847 to 1882. Uh, and I've got copies of most of them. I've transcribed them. Um, and they make very clear whether or not you're incorporated or not. Because your creditors want to know, if you're incorporated and I loan and, and I send you stuff, are you going to pay me back or are you going to go out of business? Because incorporation is licensed to steal. That's the whole point of incorporated, is that limited liability. License to steal, that's the other way of thinking of limited liability. Okay. Um, but in 1848, they start Georgia on the road to a general incorporation. Today, anybody can get incorporated. You just go down to the Secretary of State's office. That's all it takes. Pay your fee, fill out the forms. Get enough officers. That's it. Back then, up until 1848, you had to get a law passed. From 1848 through about 1870 or so, most people still, if they wanted a major corporation, had to get a law passed because this general incorporation is a very limited general. In the United States, it's not really until the 1860s nationwide that you're starting to see general incorporation laws nationwide. Massachusetts is the first one to really pass a big, big general incorporation. Just go down the Secretary of State's office and sign the paperwork. And the idea was everyone can have special privilege. It's kind of like, you know, you go to grade school today, they tell you everybody's special, right? Same thing. Everybody's special. You two can incorporate. You can get special privilege. Okay. Um, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> I'm under time. It's only 50 minutes in. <laughs> um, Ask me anything, and the worst I'll say is I don't know. <laughs> um, have you come across anything that ties in from the uh, from the state? government's uh, perspective uh, about wanting to kick the Indians out 1830 to 1840 was the Indian removal time. Um, they obviously wanted to push westward into Cherokee country, start settling there. Did that have something to do with wanting to build the railroad westward? Not so much the railroad. Okay. It's not that we build the railroad and we get rid of the Indians. It's more along the lines of they see the Indians as obstacles to further economic development. Um, you can't develop something until you own it. And if the Indians are occupying it, they have the right to use it under the rules of, of our country. They, we don't, the United States government did not recognize it as their property, but it recognized that they have the right of use. And that you can't extinguish their right of use until they voluntarily 
leave it or you pay them to leave that use. And so starting in the 1820s throughout the South, but particularly in Georgia, there's a big push to get rid of the Native Americans. Um, so there's an illegal treaty in 1825, the Treaty of Indian Springs. It was a bald-faced cheat. There's no other way to describe it. Um, let's get part of the Creek Nation to agree to give up the land of the entire Creek Nation in Georgia, even though they don't have the right to do that. And oh, by the way, the Creek National Council has passed a law saying that if you deal with the white folks separately from the Creek National Council, it's A, illegal, and B, treason, and we will kill you. A guy named William McIntosh does this. He happens to be the first cousin of the governor of the state. Okay, George M. Troop, for whom Troop County is named. McIntosh County is named. Actually, for both of theirs, grandfather, Lachlan McIntosh, I love saying this, Lachlan McIntosh, um, who killed Buff Gwinnett, oh, by the way. First, first governor of Georgia was killed by Lachlan McIntosh uh, in a duel. They didn't get along. Um, but anyway, um, it starts in 1825. Um, they have this illegal treaty of Indian Springs. Um, it goes to the U.S. Senate, they pass it, and then there's a big outcry. The Senate and the Adams administration, John Quincy Adams, pass a second treaty. That's not quite as bad, but almost as bad. They call it the Treaty of Washington. But in the end, Georgia still gets the Treaty of Indian Springs rammed down their throat, even though officially it's never a treaty. Okay? And the Creek are kicked out. So everything south of what is today, I-20, south of Atlanta, it's now the state of Georgia. It's no longer the Creek Nation. They're given six months to leave town. Actually, not even that, because the state starts to uh, survey the land to sell it off almost immediately. Okay. Um, Alabama feels really left out because the Creek Nation still exists across the Chattahoochee River in Alabama for another five or six years until they find a way to get rid of the Creek from there. So the only natives who are left in Georgia are the Cherokee, and the Cherokee do something abominable in 1828. They invent a written language. And they not only create a written language, it's actually a syllabary rather than an alphabet. Uh, 88 syllables is what they started with. I think they eventually refined it down to 82 or something like that. 80-something um, syllables. Every, every word in the Cherokee Nation can be made up of 80-something syllables. Okay. Not all at once, necessarily. Um, but, uh, and then they make a written constitution in which they declare themselves to be a republic, a sovereign republic. And the state of Georgia freaks out. How can you have two republics in one place? Do we not have jurisdiction over the entire boundary of Georgia according to the U.S. Constitution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And so that's when the state of Georgia passes a law that says that constitution doesn't matter. Cherokee Nation doesn't exist. We will extend our laws over you. And then they discover gold. <laughs> and it only gets worse from there. Well, the reason I ask is my uh, one of my relatives is William Sly. He's governor from 1835 to 1837. And he owned Cotton Factor. He and his brother John, outside of Augusta. Yeah, they had, um, had a good bit to do with the Georgia Railroad to the side of the act to incorporate the... Sly followed Lumpkin, didn't he? I think I think it goes. Truth, Gilmer, Lumpkin, Schley. No, I'm not sure who comes next. I'm, I'm actually not a Georgia historian, so I don't know. Uh, but I think that's how it goes. Somewhere in there, Lumpkin, Schley, and and Schley was a troop. No, no, no. He was a Clark man. Judge Judge Schley. That's what they called it. Every judge was always superior to governor. You know, if you were a judge, you always got called judge the rest of your life. Didn't matter whether you were senator or governor or president, you were always judged the rest of your life. Because being judged was forever. So, Augustine Clay was Judge Clay. Uh, but, oh, so uh, in his address to the legislature in 1835, which is in the, I think it's online actually. Proverb. Harvard has a hard copy. Um, he talked about how hard it was moving troops and supplies and so forth westward for the Indian removal. And, uh, well, the Treaty of Minnesota is signed in 1835. John Ross, who's the principal chief, is going to protest it um, because they had this ruling from the U.S. Supreme Court saying they didn't have to do any of the stuff that Georgia wanted them to do, that, that, they didn't, that Georgia had no jurisdiction over them. 
And Georgia says, we don't recognize the Supreme Court as having any jurisdiction over us. <laughs> it's called states' rights. Um, and Augustine Clayton, again, is, is one of these people. This is why I know a considerable amount of sort of research about that. Um, and, and so there is, that is going to be one of their arguments about why they need to improve transportation. But it's because the state wants to build a railroad across the Cherokee Nation up to Chattanooga, from the Chattahoochee to the Tennessee Rivers. To connect, which they had been thinking about building a canal as early as 1826. They sent Wilson Lumpkin, the Lumpkin County team, uh, to survey, ex-Congressman ex Lumpkin, they called him, uh, before he became governor. Um, ex-Congressman Lumpkin, he was out of office for two years at that point, so in 1826 he surveys the mountain passes, and he comes back and says, well, I, I think those mountains are a little steep for, for a canal. But there's this new fangled thing called the railroad we ought to be thinking about. So Lumpkin's thinking about this as early as 1826. 1826 is when the first railroad was built in the United States outside Boston. It's a mine car. It's kind of like the Lana the mine car ride at, yeah. at Six Flags. You know, it's all gravity. You know, it's all downhill by gravity and then you crank it back up. That's the very first railroad in, in America, and that was in 1826. So this is really forward thinking. Uh, our leadership was a very forward-thinking act. They really thought in terms of economic development. It, they also thought in terms of racism. It, it was no big deal to them to deal with people of other races unequally. They thought that was normal. It was like breathing. And that's, that's the hard thing for us to get our arms around, is, is how normal racism was. And that, in a way, shows us how far we've come, despite how much further we still need to go. You have questions. Yeah, um, when did the Athens industrial case begin to decline? And what are the major causes outside the Civil War? Um, Civil War really had nothing to do with it. Civil War didn't come to Athens. Um, closest it got was Watkins, who affected their markets. Yeah, yeah, but, but the factories double their size, double their output, go on three shifts. Um, the, fact, the factories didn't have enough resources, but when the war comes to an end, this is in the last chapter of my book, when the war comes to an end, if you had cotton, it was worth a hundred times more than what it was worth at the beginning of the Civil War because there was a worldwide shortage of cotton because 90% of the cotton came from the American South and cotton was the basis of the Industrial Revolution in the early 19th century. So the second, I mean, Downtown Columbus was burned to the ground by, by uh, uh, Wilson's Raiders. The entire downtown area, which was a big industrial center, was burned to the ground. Sherman, when he attacked Atlanta, had the industrial census in his hands and knew where all the factories were. He didn't burn randomly. He knew exactly what he wanted to burn. He didn't get crazy with matches until he left town. On the way in, he only burned the factories. So Roswell, Georgia, got burned to the ground. Uh, there's a paper mill, there's a cotton factory. Uh, New Manchester, where Sweetwater Creek State Park is today. You want to see a factory Sherman burn? It's still there. It's one of the neatest things I've ever seen. The state of Georgia would love to bulldoze and turn it into tennis courts. But, you know, it is a state park, so we have to have tennis courts and golf course. But it was a town of a thousand people. And it disappeared as a result of Sherman. But places like Roswell, the very next year, they rebuilt completely. Columbus rebuilt the next year at double the size. They had the resources. In Athens, John White, from whom White, White Hall was named, he ran the Georgia factory, was an Irishman who sent $60,000 in gold out of the country during the Civil War, so that at the end of the war, he had it, he brought it back and started the Bank of Athens, or Athens National Bank, I guess it was called. Okay. And he became a banker the rest of his life and turned over his factories to his sons and became Clark County's first millionaire. So um, the decline probably is more or less along. It wasn't that they declined, it's that other places got ahead. That's the first thing. Um, as the resource, Athens is a little bit located off the main line. You only had one railroad until the 1880s. And so until they got a second railroad, they had to pay whatever Augusta wanted them to pay. And Augusta wanted them to pay through the nose because they didn't want competition from Athens. And so Augusta did their best to keep Athens under its thumb. Okay. But in the 1880s, they get a couple extra lines. But by that time, there are a lot of other places that are also up and coming. 
most important of which is Atlanta. And there's a main railroad going all the way to Washington, D.C. It's called the Airline. Um, from Atlanta to Washington, D.C. Um, from Atlanta to Charlotte, it's known as the Atlanta Charlotte Airline. If you go to Hall County, there's a town on the Airline. It's located on the railroad. It's been there since the 1880s. Airline meant straight by air. You go on the air, draw a line, that's the airline. And so you want to go straight from Atlanta to Charlotte, from Charlotte to Richmond, and from Richmond to Washington, D.C. That's the airline. What eventually becomes, well, today we call it the Southern Crescent. It's part of the Amtrak, the Southern Crescent Line. Um, but the real decline probably comes with, with the Great Depression, because all these cotton factories go under. You know, it's just that they're outdated. Um, they're, they're not doing so well. Um, you know, they can't, they don't have the deep pockets to keep people going. And so, for instance, the Georgia, the, the Athens factories kept going as a warehouse for chickpea. Chickpea locates across the Oconee River in uh, what had been um, the army, the old army, uh, which was built during the Civil War. And uh, by the way, they had, they had mortgages, it's a really great mortgage because it listed all the equipment in the 1863 mortgage, which is in some of the county record books. It's very cool. Um, all the equipment they had because they took out a loan for like a half a million dollars to build that. And Confederate money, which wasn't pretty much. <coughs> I think I'm seeing that they're they're pointing to their watches. Is that what I'm seeing? I have one question. Okay. With all the horsepower economically in Athens and all the industrial benchmark, why didn't Sherman throw more resources? If he went after all the industrial areas around on the Marshall Sea, why didn't he come after Athens with more horsepower? If you can if you can destroy the railroads, it doesn't really matter how much you produce. In, in the end, Sherman did two things. He destroyed as many of the big factories as he could, and more importantly, he destroyed the railroad, uh, what we'll call a Sherman uh, bow tie, you ever heard of that? And you take the, the iron rails, you superheat them so that they're bendable, and then wrap them around a tree, and you cannot get, even if you reheat them, you can't get them back into shape without melting them down and starting from scrap. Um, so if you can get the Confederate Army to tear up the railroads, which Sherman did, Sherman was a really smart guy. He sent troops out east on the Georgia Railroad, and it's the Confederate Army thinking that Sherman was going to attack Augusta, where there were some major uh, foundries and some major gun works and things like that, and, and gunpowder works, particularly the gunpowder works. But he left that alone. He did, because if you destroy if you destroy the rails, you can't get it anywhere. And so by by the end of 1864, most of the industrial structure of the Confederacy was gone, at least transportation. -wise. Um, he destroyed enough of the factories and destroyed enough of the transportation network that you couldn't get the stuff that you needed from here to there, to where you needed it. You couldn't get it to Petersburg. You couldn't get it to the various places where you actually needed it. And so if you wanted to supply in Petersburg, which is a major front, you had to get it from Richmond. And Richmond can only do so much. Well, I guess historically I was thinking he went after Macon and then kind of went after Athens. He didn't just really commit a lot of resources. He didn't. Why bother? You know, if you don't have to commit resources to cut them off, why bother? Athens was out of the way. And if you could cut off the transportation network, then you don't have to actually destroy the factories to keep them from producing full war material. At that point, they can produce, but it's going to be for local production. And so you're going to find by late 1864, the Athens factories are mainly producing for the local defense forces which are then sent down to Savannah to defend against Sherman and Savannah. But they're not being used for, for producing things for the Confederate Army anymore. Though they had, they had had contracts with the Confederate military. The whole Confederate military logistics supply system is really screwed to the guy. It was very political and very badly done. Lots of folks were alive. Um, so it's, it's, it wasn't done all that well. But what, what it comes down to is, is that um, the Union had a much better plan about how to fight a long-term war than the Confederacy did. And their long-term plan was, it starts at the beginning with the Anaconda, Anaconda Plan. Let's strangle them from the outside, keep them from getting supplies from Great Britain. Which, Great Britain meant Bermuda and Bahamas. That's where they were shipping it from. Because they could ship from England to the Bahamas, and that's perfectly legal. It's from the Bahamas to the United States that was illegal. And that's where the blockade was. 
And as that blockade became better and better and better, by January 1865, the only southern port still open was Wilmington, North Carolina. Okay. But after after July 4th, 1863, you couldn't cross you couldn't cross the Mississippi. So all that leather and stuff that was coming in from Mexico and Texas, you could land stuff in Mexico, bring it through Texas over land, but you couldn't get it across the Mississippi where most of the fighting was. So, you know, this was the North's basic plan was to fight a logistics war. You know, if they don't have guns, they can't fight you very well throwing shoes at you, and particularly the shoes all have holes. You know, when, when um, Lee invaded Pennsylvania at Gettysburg, 10,000 of his men had no shoes. Try marching 100 miles in three days with no shoes. And you're not going to be very good for fighting. And that was the North's plan, was to cut off the supply. It doesn't matter how brave they are. They can be better trained than us. They can be braver than us. But if they ain't got weapons, they can't fight us. So that, that was the Northern plan, was you know, we don't have to rely on how brave and well-trained our people are if, if we can deny our enemies the tools by which they can fight us with. So even though the Cook Brothers Arsenal was operational, they still had a rare destruction plan in mind. That, Cook Brothers was, was small. It, it never produced that many weapons, is my understanding. You know, they were geared up. If the work had gone on a couple more years, it, it might have been important because the Confederacy was thinking about buying it. They sent some people down here to look at it because it was a well-run one. It was probably the best, from my understanding, one of the best-run uh, armories in the country you know, that the Confederacy had. But the problem was is that they just they were kind of out of the way. And, and, you know, it's just, you can only buy so many things if you can't transport it. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. Good.